All right, we're continuing on in John 12, chap, uh, chapter 12, verse 12, as a matter of fact. You recall that last week you discussed how uh, Jesus had visited <coughs> Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who was ra- who he, whom he raised from the dead, and had a meal with them, and that, uh, of course, Mary came in with the alabaster of, of uh, fine oil, and uh, Judas Iscariot complained about the whole thing. Of course, his, he had no business complaining about it, because that was what she had chosen to do with it, and, and you know, it was, after all, he, it was, Judas didn't buy it. The ointment was being used for a good work, but he hadn't, so he had no right to condemn the other's good work, you know, because of what he thought that, uh, what they ought to be doing with it. There's something inherently wrong with criticizing someone else or something else to build yourself or your, or, or your pet project up, you know. Uh, sometimes people get the idea that by tearing others down, that builds them up, you know, it, but uh, and whereas Judas was criticizing her, first of all, he had had no part in the contribution that she was giving, and he had no business criticizing what she had had uh, used it for. Um, <coughs> Jesus saw Jesus Judas was what witnessing a good work, but he criticized it. Why? What was his attitude about the whole thing? And so as Jesus makes the point, let her alone against the day of my bearing has she kept this. She had, dedic- she had purposes in her mind to be used for this. The, and he, he goes on to, to justify her actually says, for the poor always, always you have with you, but ye ha- have not all, me you have not always. Well, in, in verse 9, much people, the Jews therefore knew that, there, that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised and raised from the dead. So that people were gathering about. There's a crowd gathering about because Jesus was there, realizing that he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, as we pick up in, in verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees uh, and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So now we have two large groups of people that are, that are congregating about Jesus. First, the group that came that night before that uh, were following after him. And now as he came into Jerusalem, the group that, that went and they grabbed up palm trees, palm limbs, and, and they sang out, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's interesting to note that uh, the... Uh, uh, the palm branches had a specific meaning. Look at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. Leviticus 23, verse 40. <clears throat> So as we, he's actually discussing the different feasts that they were to, to go um, participate in. Verse 37 of chapter 23, These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything upon, this day, upon his day, beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. Yeah, that's incredible. What he just went through. Besides all your gifts, besides all your vows, beside all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord, but also, and, and beside all your Sabbaths, but also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. Okay? But as we, uh, it's interesting to note that beside all that other stuff that God has, has commanded you to give, and they were giving, but also on these feasts. So they, they were, they were, uh, you think about how much that the, the Israelites would contribute uh, as offerings to God. And, and, and it wasn't just tithing their 10%. It was a lot of other things they were involved with. But as we see in verse 40 then, And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So these branches had, had significance they were to be used in, in, as we see in these feasts. One has said that it was more or less a, a symbol or a sign of, of, of victory um, or, or of triumph, I should say. We see in Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Uh, 
uh, John writing, he says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, with no man could number, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So uh, as we consider that it was to be, there's those palms were used in the, 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 as part of the festi festivities and the, and the feasts that they were to go to in Jerusalem, but also it was an image that's used by John that showing these, those ones in white robes before the throne with the palms. And as one has said, it's, it's a, a symbol of triumph as we consider Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, let's read on a little bit, then we'll discuss more about uh, uh, the triumphal entry. So he took palms of branch trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, that being blessed... Uh, that's a term to use for, for a request for being blessed. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Look at Psalm 118, verse Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We, uh, we have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So the term Hosanna is ref in reference to this. Does the American Standard use the term Hosanna in any of these verses, Kara? Okay, no. But as I, that's what my notes are saying, that, that uh, Hosanna, be, meaning blessed, or a, beseech, to be a request for being blessed. And so as they, they sing Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel. So yes, Jesus himself being glorified like this, blessed in a sense, uh, like this. And they're, they're having these palm branches they're, 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 they have bring, brought with them. Um, and Jesus, in verse 14, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Sion. Behold, thy king cometh sitting on, on an ass's colt. Zechariah 9.9 9 is what that references to. Think about great kings and mighty warriors and conquerors. Think of Alexander the Great. Think of the, the Persian kings that would, that would conquer their people as they went, the Assyrians. And they would come into a city. What would be, what would be their mount as they would come into a city? Great horse. Great horse, yeah. A, a, a symbol of power, of... of uh, uh, military uh, prowess, and uh, of course the horse being a tremendous platform of that day for, for uh, uh, mobility in, in uh, launching weapons, you know. Um, and, and so, uh, where that would be, the king of this world would do that, but yet what does Jesus ride in on? A humble, uh, small colt, one that had not been ridden before, rather than coming as a conqueror, he came, as we see, his kingdom was not one of, of uh, conquest, but rather, rather of peace. So as Jesus sat there on, as, as he fulfilled the, the, uh, the prophecy and then writing in on that colt. 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things un, unto him. So... Um, as these things were occurring, um, being the Westerner like I am, and I read this stuff, so that's peculiar. It's strange that they get these palm, tree, palm limbs and wave them around and crying, Hosanna, I'm sure it has significance. But we see this is all about his, his uh, victorious or triumphal entry into Jerusalem as the king, uh, but not like the kings of this world. Um, and a lot of attention is being given to him as we read on. Uh, the disciples didn't understand all these things, what well, the significance they were. But later on, uh, after his crucifixion, his resurrection, they understood. Of course, Jesus himself opened up the scriptures to them to, that they can understand uh, his fulfillment of these prophecies. The people, therefore, that was with him, in verse 17, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. They reported these events. Um, so we have uh, eyewitness accounts of these, these things that are going on. 
For this cause, the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. So they were they were heard the, the the reports that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. So they came to see Jesus. They came to see Lazarus because of this. This it was like, wow! It's it's something. It's like the greatest spectacle that they'd ever ever heard of. You know, and. Uh, uh, verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. And so some view that, that there are two different uh, groups in the Fer- among the Pharisees. Those Pharisees who had minded to kill Jesus, and to, you know, they had sent out word that if you know where Jesus is, tell us that we'll go get him. And people were afraid that to confess Jesus, could they be put out of the synagogue? All this was... was uh, um, um, uh, done by the Pharisees to, because they're trying to put Jesus down and take uh, take him out, take and have him, uh, of course, have him killed. And as one group of Pharisees may have been saying, at least the Pharisees were saying, "Look, all the work we're doing, it's not it's not for any good. They're still following after him. All the things you do, all the things you try to 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 uh, uh, strong arm the people, try to to." Uh, you, bear down on them to make them feel uh, self-conscious about, uh, about being associated with Jesus. It's not working. Look, they're still coming. Even the whole world, of course, this is they might call a uh, hyperbole that is an exaggeration. The whole world. Well, there are a lot of people, a lot of people in Jerusalem, um, and particularly on these feasts. This is the Feast of the Passover, one of the, one of the uh, uh, I guess, I say, what we say, one of the more popular, but that's the one we read a lot about. And, of course, the Passover being the, uh, the Passover feast, eating the unleavened bread, eating the lamb, of course, remembering their, their deliverance from, from Pharaoh out of Egypt. Um, and as everybody, as Jesus was coming into town, everybody having heard him raise Lazarus from the dead, and they're all about cheering, crying out, Hosanna, waving the palms, you know. And it's, it's you can just imagine those Pharisees having perceiving that their influence is diminishing. People are leaving them for Jesus, and they had no more control. Adam. Plus, there's the significance of the young cult. Um, I think I believe I forget what account it says that uh, almost no one has ever set. So the cult itself has never, has never been broken into. So instead of seeing Jesus, also the cult was uh, docile. I, yeah, I don't know. There must be significance to it simply because they specify it. Not only did you know specified in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament scripture, the prophecy. I don't know enough about it to discuss it, but. Uh, Buck him. Okay. Okay. And yet here was Jesus riding upon him, and I guess in total control. Uh, after seeing all the miracles that Jesus has performed, you know, calming the sea, that, that'd be a trifle thing to calm a donkey, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so as the Pharisees were just discussing among themselves the uselessness and the, the uh, vanity of the, all the projects they put in place to try to stop the popularity of Jesus, and it wasn't working. Behold, the world's gone after him. And it's interesting that today, the whole world does go after Jesus. Those who are interested and inclinated towards spiritual matters, finding everlasting life, where do they go? Well, the only source of, it, of salvation. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Um, um, and, and as we go, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Now, these being Greeks, were, were um, they weren't of Jewish blood. They were probably proselytes because they came to worship at the feast, as they had been converted to Judaism, yet they were not of Abraham's bloodline. Okay? Um, and as they had come among them that came up to worship at the feast, the same came, therefore, to Philip, which was Beth, Bethsaida, the Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. They wanted to have an audience with Jesus, much like 
Nicodemus did. Okay. Um, and they, and uh, <coughs> so they requested it. As I had read, that where they were was probably in the court of the, the, of the women. It's where no, no, uh, no men were allowed. Is that right? Or no, no, none of that group were allowed to go, so they had to request, uh, go through channels to try to get Jesus, to, get to, to meet with Jesus. In verse 22, Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip, Philip tell Jesus. So they were coming, they were wondering what to do. How, or, you know, so, they, they, so Andrew goes to talk to Philip to join in in this, okay, I can't, sort of like, you know, you feel more uh, confident when you're joined with the group. And he, is he, is he uh, get, enlists the uh, aid of his, of Philip, or I'd rather, or as, as Philip enlists the aid of Andrew, and they go and both tell Jesus. Now, in verse 23, and Jesus answered him, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, Jesus answered whom? We see that Philip and Andrew go and, and tell Jesus that these Greeks want to talk to you. So was Jesus talking to Philip and Andrew alone? Was he talking to Philip and Andrew and those that were about them? Or was he talking to those Greeks? It would seem like he would be talking to those Greeks who wanted to talk to Jesus just as Nicodemus wanted to meet with Jesus and Jesus revealing the truth about the gospel. You know, you, must, uh, you can't see the kingdom of heaven except you be born again. And he was giving him fundamental, giving Nicodemus fundamental information. As we see here, Jesus is giving his audience here fundamental information. So it would lead one to believe that these Greeks were successful in being able to meet with Jesus as this message was given from him. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. You recall earlier that, that uh, they were wanting to take Jesus by force. Uh, whether to stone him or, or, or to make him king, but it was not yet his hour, so he left. They, didn't, they were not able to uh, take him. But here he says himself, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, or once again, truly, like it's a matter of fact, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat f fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. He's giving him a paradox teaching, a paradoxical teaching. That is, if you love your life, if you really want to live forever, give up your life's interest now in, in view of the, the uh, everlasting life. That's what he says. You know, he that loveth his life shall lose it. If you, ever, if you focus everything in your life on what's here now and gaining all your possessions, rather than spiritual matters, you're going to lose your life. It's going to end. It's going to come to death. But if you love, rather, and he that hates his life in this world should keep it unto life eternal. It doesn't mean you despise your life. It means you don't love as much your physical life here as you love your, the spiritual life that is to come. And if you focus upon that, you'll find life, everlasting life. Of course, the, the uh, caveat to that is, what does it mean to uh, find everlasting life? If you're looking for it, you'll find it. But what does that entail? In finding it, there are certain requirements that God has put upon us. Of course, we know the plan of salvation. Believe, confess, repent, be baptized. And then one, when one has learned these things, and uh, this is the way to everlasting life, that's what he does. Um, Excuse me. And so he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. It's just the natural order of things. As we have become members of the body of Christ, we become a member of God's family, and uh, there are the spirit, many spiritual blessings that we find in Christ in, and in the fellowship of the saints that... Uh, um, as we consider, as we follow Christ, um, that's, I mean, 
it, it's just, and where, uh, where I am, there shall also my servant be. Well, that makes sense. But you consider wherever Christ is, where is Christ? What, you think about what is his purpose, okay? As we love less our own life and commit ourselves to following after Christ, his, his desires are what's more important to us than our own desires for ourselves. And so as he has intentions to save mankind through the spreading of the gospel, that's what we're going to be about. <clears throat> if any man serve me, him will my father honor. So there is, uh, there's the honor that comes from the father and there's the honor that comes from men. The Pharisees that wanted to kill Jesus won the honor that came from men. In fact, they, they saw their honor diminishing as Christ was, was, as more people were being drawn to Christ. Okay. And this next verse is interesting in that uh, it's more of an inter, it's more of a introspective thought. As he's talking about his, uh, his, the hour has come to him to be glorified, and that he talks about, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much. That is possibly talking about his death, his physical death. As he, his, that he's like the corn of wheat falls from the ground and die, it abides alone. It won't grow. But as Christ was crucified, he died, was buried. When he came back from the grave, of course, um, there was, was great, bountiful fruits that came from this. Uh, the fact that the gospel message was preached. Um, and, it, and, you know, the gospel couldn't have been preached except Jesus was raised, risen from the dead. The faith, the Christian faith couldn't exist except for Jesus raised, was raised from the dead. And none of this, no, the church, the kingdom, would not have been here except Christ was raised from the dead. And so as... One could relate to the, 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 you take the wheat, the, the grain of wheat, and, you, and it, you let it dry out, and you plant it in the field as crops. Only then, after it's died, can it bring forth more fruit. <clears throat> now, in verse 27, now is my soul troubled, as, as he's considering that his own death. Uh, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I into this hour. I mean, what am I going to say? Save me from what I'm going to have to endure? But that's the reason I came. But he's relating that he's troubled. His soul is troubled. Okay. So, um, and that's, you know, one looks at this, like, well, that's more like something you'd say to yourself. You, you see, heard it like the, the, the uh, Shakespearean plays where you have the monologue where, where um, I'm not a big Shakespearean uh, uh, Scott, you know, I'm not, I don't know very much about them, but just a tidbits here and there, as I consider that, uh, uh, who was it that was saying, to be or not to be? That was, Mitch, that was uh, Hamlet. Camelot, or Hamlet. Hamlet. Hamlet was saying, to be or not to be. What was he saying? Should I live or should I kill myself? And that's something he wouldn't tell, tell you know, go out and proclaim to everybody. That's something he's, he's thinking to himself. As we look at this, this verse 27, Jesus perhaps is thinking to himself, my, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Keep, save me from this? Father, save me from this? But this is why I came. Okay. It's in verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from him, heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So uh, as God had glorified his name, and so he will again, uh, and what's interesting, in verse 29, the people thereof that stood by and heard it said that it, it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. So the perception was much like Paul upon the road to Damascus. And Jesus approached him on the road and appeared to him. Well, the guys that were, the men that were with Paul, they fell down, and they, didn't, they couldn't perceive what was being said. In fact, they thund, some thought it was thunderous. And uh, as it was here, some didn't. Some thought it was just thundering. Others thought understood that it to be it was an angel spake to him. Well, it was the Father speaking to him. Interesting. Once again, the first member of the Godhead manifesting his presence there in the presence of the second member of the Godhead. Okay. Um, uh, 
in verse 30, Jesus answered, said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. So it was the benefit of them, of the, everybody around him, that, that uh, to hear God's voice, that, uh, that, that, that it happened. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. It's time. The prince of this world, who is he talking about? Satan, the devil. And, uh, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He's talking about his. Then verse 33, this he said, signifying what death he should die. He's talking about crucifixion. And it's coming down to brass tacks now. This is the point at which Satan will be cast out from this world. The power of Satan will no longer be. Jesus came to destroy the works of Satan. The works of Satan was to deceive men into sinning. And in Jesus' dying upon the cross, the effects of that, of course, in sinning, man finds death. And so the, the works of Satan has resulted in the death of mankind, but Jesus is going to destroy those works. In his, his being crucified upon the cross, shedding his blood for the sins of the world, that mankind can find everlasting life, destroying the works of Satan. And uh, <clears throat> so, as they, the, so <clears throat> it's, it, it's Jesus making the, the point that now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. It's finally coming to a head. And Jesus knows his time is near. It's, it, it's within days. It's within days that Jesus will be nailed to the cross. Verse 34, the people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever, and how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So they still, those people hearing him, still didn't tie together the idea that, that the Messiah, the Son of God, is the same one who's the Son of Man, that God in the flesh. And... Uh, And so they're, they're wondering, who, what do you mean? Who is this son of man? Verse 35, then Jesus said to them, yet a little while is light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While you have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. So he gave the last pronouncement to them. I'm here now. I'm the light. Remember in chapter 1, John saying the light, Jesus, that the word was, um, <clears throat> verse 4, John 1, 4, in him was life, the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Um, the light, darkness oh, it could not overpower it. So Jesus being the light of the world, why who was in here, he's saying, it's, it's, my time is coming, my time is now, it's coming very soon. It's just a little while and I'm going to be gone. I'm the light, of course, he is being the light of the world. So you need to walk in likeness. You don't in the light, uh, lest the darkness come, up, uh, come upon you, so that you won't be deceived by the darkness of this world. Okay. <clears throat> He's trying, and it's his last discourse with any public discourse at all. Last time he talks to anybody, uh, that it talks to a group publicly. Um, and after that, he departed and did hide himself from them. No more messages to them. That, that was the final warning. Um, okay. <coughs> so first three said, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That's very interesting that in spite of all seeing all these miracles, and they certainly know that it comes from God. We discussed a lot about the, his healing the blind man who was blind from birth, and that the blind man could now see, not only physically, but spiritually. He, was, he understood that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, the, the Samaritan woman, she, was, she saw that uh, the, Jesus, him being a prophet, he was the, the Messiah, and that she brought the whole town to him, and, and many believed on him because of his words. Um, <clears throat> but all the miracles that Jesus performed, especially Lazarus raising up from the dead, 
But in spite of all that, they didn't believe. There were those that did not believe. And it's interesting that, that John, the whole purpose of John writing, of course, is John 20, verse 30 and 31. And many other th- signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have through life through his name. It's very interesting that John writes about these miracles, that we can believe that Jesus is the Son of God and have everlasting life. They saw it firsthand. They heard it from eyewitnesses about the, the, the miracles. Some believed. Most didn't believe. And yet John is writing a testimony of these things, his, his own account of these things. And whereas we, the reader, don't, haven't witnessed the miracles. We haven't seen the, the raising of the dead. We haven't seen the healing of the blind. We haven't seen all these things. And yet by reading the account, we can have our, our faith and be in Christ Jesus as the Son of God. Okay. And so yet they believe not on him. Verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? We can go to Isaiah Chapter 53, verse 1, who has believed our report? And so, I mean, that's not just merely believing, don't, not believing the report. That's not believing the actual things that happen. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So it was prophesied. So, question, did Jesus purposely harden their hearts so they would de- reject him? No, I mean, it hurts me. It's an opinion. It's, it's what? When you harden your hearts, it's you're closing down, your, you're, you're right. refusing to listen, you've rejected yeah. wisdom and instruction. For whatever reason, whether it be personal biases, pre, pre, pre-judging, pre uh, <coughs> your own preconceptions, um, all these things. Just as, as Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. Sometimes the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Sometimes it said that Moses hardened his heart. Sometimes it said that God hardened his heart. And so we can see the word of God has one of two different effects, doesn't it? Meaning the actions, yes. Yes. There's, there's the action, there's the result. And it wasn't that God forced Pharaoh to be hardened of heart. Rather, it was the words that God spoke to him, Pharaoh didn't like. He hated those words, and he, sh- he shut off his ears. He hardened his heart. He was not going to hear what God had to say to them. And so it was that Jesus didn't make those people harden their hearts, reject him. Rather, the words that he spoke, they, had, they didn't accept him. And so they themselves actually hardened their own hearts. But as because of that, because of their, their, their attitude about Jesus, they, they blinded themselves. They were, it rendered them in, unable to see the truth, what Jesus was bringing them. And that goes on today so much, too. Um, <laughs> I think of uh, Naaman, remember, when he w- was uh, told to dip in the, in the Jordan seven times. He said, what? You know, you remember, here's his response. You know, I'd rather go, to, what's wrong with the, my home rivers? You know, those are nice, pristine rivers. This Jordan River, that's just an old, muddy old creek, you know. And, and, and I thought he'd come out and wave his arms around, you know. People have preconceived ideas about what happens when we're saved or what kind of things go on when we're saved. Where they get these ideas, that, that is what happens. Well, it's, that's where false doctrine comes into play. False doctrine is so prevalent that people have these preconceived ideas about what they must do to be saved because they're constantly barraged with instructions like pray the sinner's prayer. And, and you think, well, Paul wasn't prayed by praying a sinner's prayer. Um, and, you know, we can go on and on that they, they reject Christ. For either they don't like the plan of salvation because it doesn't meet with their what they think is right, like Naaman thought. 
you know, he didn't, he didn't meet his, his, his uh, expectations. Or they just can't stand the idea that, that uh, of uh, they're guilty of sin, they're going to be held accountable for it. They can't stand to have to, to humble themselves before the Lord. I heard it once said, I can't remember who said it, but he, uh, people have a cherry-picked notion of religion. They have a cherry-picked notion of Christ. They pick and choose what they like about him and mm-hmm. ignore all the rest. And if you bring that to bring them, they're like, well, you can't have one thing without the other because they're in tandem. Well, they get upset because... A, they know that's correct, and B, they don't want to change because it's easier to follow their preconceived notions. Mm-hmm. So. Right, absolutely right. Um, um, people love the baby Jesus. When they talk about the birth of Christ, and they say, oh, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. Yeah, it's true. That's exactly what the scripture teach. But what they don't like is when Jesus grows up to be a man, and he makes demands. You know, all of a sudden... Repent of one's sins, be, be, uh, have a contrite heart, be honest toward God. Um, yeah, and it's like, well, yeah, they like the baby Jesus because the baby Jesus doesn't make demands on them. But the adult Jesus, the man, making demands. And so, wow. Um, and and I, I have to laugh when I, when I brought up that all these, these uh, things that God had required of the Old Testament Jews, of all the offerings, you know, the, the tithing, and then the way they would reap their crops, they would, there was some of the crops they'd leave, the corners they'd leave, so that the strangers could come, the, the travelers could come and, and glean the, the, uh, the, the wheat off the field so that as they're traveling, because they didn't, have, they didn't top, have Taco Bell in every, every corner, you know. They had... Uh, uh, they had just what was there, um, uh, and just the goodwill of 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 uh, the locals that they wouldn't glean the entire field. They leave it open by God's commandment. A lot of things that they would give, and then and of course they're not only did they have to make their sacrifices, their animal sacrifices, and, and the other other sacrifices, but also they they travel hundreds, thousand, a thousand miles or so to go to Jerusalem to participate in these feasts that were commanded of them. And if they look at what they gave, you know, they didn't have the, the, uh, the covenant that we have. Their covenant was different. And it was more demanding. They had to do so much more, and they didn't have forgiveness of sins in reality yet. It was still in prospect. So when... Uh, um, Jesus died on the cross. Now, forget, real forgiveness of sins is available. And, but, but the law of Moses is put away, so we're not obligated to fulfill the aspects of the, of the law of Moses, like tithing, although we do give as we've been prospered. Or we don't, as we, as we reap our crops, or all the things that, that was required of them to do, we don't have to do. And so whereas they had to do so much more, more demanding, but yet... Uh, uh, they didn't have the same benefits. It, it was in prospect, yes. But yet, we, with our new covenant, having so much greater promise, and you know, we have real forgiveness of sins, and yet it's not as demanding as the old law of Moses. I have to laugh at, at folks who think, oh man, I'm expected to do what? You know, <laughs> um, and their service to Christ is like, what? I just have to laugh at the differences in, in, in their expectations, and what what they're demanding, you know, what they, they're, what they don't want to do. Okay. No, oh. What, what's the culmination of everything? 
Yeah. But if they don't That's right. So, in total, it's, it's total. Even their, even their own prophet, Daniel, even said... They won't believe him. Yeah. They won't believe him. Uh, it's been 2,000 years since the prophecy has been all fulfilled. And yet, in all that time, many, any that are continuing in the Jewish religion, what are they waiting for, like you said? The Romans are long gone. The, the Roman Empire is gone. It's, and so, so I have read, I'm not an expert, I just happened to read that uh, the anticipation, expectations of the Jews has changed from that of a physical Messiah coming, rather it's come to, he's in, uh, symbolic of, of uh, the Jewish nation blessing the world, not, uh, not that there be an individual that would come. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, they can't really. The, to the inth, to the fullest extent, they cannot practice their limit religion because there's no temple. You know. They should build one. Mm -hmm. And there are no priests. There are no, there priests, no priests. And they can't can't have priests, can they? Why can't they have priests? That's right. They, you know, the, to be a priest, you had to be of a the tribe of Re, Levi. To be a high priest, you had to be of the bloodline of Aaron, also a Levite. Um, and in AD 70, all the records were, were de de I said deleted. <laughs> the records were <laughs> burned, destroyed, so they don't have record of the, uh, I, uh, they don't have official records of the, of the lineage, so they can't really prove themselves to be, a pre uh, to, to be able to officiate as a priest or the high priest. Um, and what's sad is, and, and Paul saw this too, that of all the promises that God had given his, his chosen people, and yet when it came to the fact, they hardened their hearts. It wasn't what they wanted or expected. And, and so they're left empty. When Jesus said in Matthew 23, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, uh, that's probably the saddest, saddest proclamation ever. That uh, of all the things, of all the promises that they had, and yet, when it came to fulfilling all the promises that God was giving, here God was fulfilling his promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the families of the world would be blessed, and the Jews left themselves out of that. As Paul said, you count yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we go to the Gentiles. So, so as we see in... Um, Isaiah prophesied that they would reject him, and so they were rejecting him. So next week we'll look at beginning of verse 42.